Hello and welcome. I'm glad you're stopping by because I would like to take you on a journey, uh, a journey within, if you will, a journey that goes beyond the surface appearances of human beings and is attempting to answer one of life's persistent questions, which is, who are we? Really? Who are we? What's the purpose of our life? At the end of this journey, I sincerely hope that you will have an experience that will allow you to find answers to this question, to better understand yourself. And if you so desire, this experience may change your life. So let's get to it and I'll see you on the other end. On the surface, I do know that I'm a creative designer by passion and a creative director by profession. I have worked in ad agencies around the world and along the way I have become a world citizen. Meaning I don't compare anymore which part of my journey so far is my favorite. Mostly I like to enjoy the present moment I like to explore the opportunities I encounter wherever I am at any given time. Two years ago, in 2018, I was asked to create an exhibition for the International Day of Yoga at the UN headquarters in New York City. So here is just uh, a picture of the entire exhibition just before it was actually inaugurated. It was a collaborative project with many talented folks in the team and the exhibition received great reviews and a lot of recognition. You may wonder why June 21st has become the International Day of Yoga. Well, as far as I know, the initiator of this yearly event, Mr. Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, put it this way. It is the day of the summer solstice. It's the longest day of the year and it's celebrated in many cultures across the globe. Okay, back to my story. Because one of the things I've learned is in essence, we are social beings, we're social creatures. We do not enjoy to be alone. Now, it is true, we want to be connected and we need to be social. It seems that makes us human. It's sort of in our genes. And the opposite of that, if you look at this picture, a person all alone, longingly looking out the window with no connection, uh, it's almost like he's in solitary confinement. And the paradox of this is, you could say a solitary confinement. Yeah, sure, bring it on. That's wonderful. I have no rent to pay. I don't have to go to work. Food is coming regularly. I have my own room. Nobody is bothering me. I can do what I want. But that's really not the case. Solitary confinement is a punishment. And it's simply because we are social beings. If we cannot interact, then something's missing. This is how we like to be. We like to be in a group of people. We like to enjoy each other's presence. We tell stories. We have good times together. Now, back to me as a designer. I, along the way, was working at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is uh, an agency of the United Nations. And there, among many other things, I also created a social campaign. And that was a while ago, I'd say 2005 maybe, before social media was invented. So it was all non-digital, analog, if you will. I created posters. And I put them up throughout the building on every floor and every meeting rooms in cafeterias and places where I picked up things that I noticed. For example, we tend to say, I'm sorry. And then I ask, when was the last time 
you said that and you actually meant it. That text is a bit smaller. The posters are rather large. So the people had to bend down to be able to read it. And then they saw at the bottom was even smaller text. One of our famous presidents here in the United States said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. And that's my religion, Abraham Lincoln. There were many other posters where I picked up things like, no problem. Well, did we actually mean it? Or was that simply a deflection? Or we say, how are you? And we don't even take the time to stop and listen if somebody has a story to tell. It's more like, hey, but we don't really mean the meaning of the words. So then I put the posters up, as you can see, on the day and nobody really knew about it. And I'm sort of with hidden camera, enjoying the reactions of the people. Most of them said, it's about time that we talk about this because we never ever address these issues of relating to each other, of being social. But as always, there is a larger picture. Carl Gustav Jung is a very famous Swiss uh, psychologist. And he said, the time is right for a new step in the human evolution. And I'm quoting here, we live in a very special time, a time of transition. It's an evolutionary shift from Homo sapiens to Homo spiritualis. That's Latin and it means towards a spiritual human being. Or if you will, in my own words, yes. Just remember this, this is our general level of awareness. And here we are, all the individual people here and everywhere. If we could just lower, deepen our awareness, we could see we are all connected. We are all one. We are connected. Like a drop that falls into the ocean and becomes the ocean. Thank you very much. So this was excerpt recorded during a TED conference. And now I would like you to come with me to a very special moment in my very personal journey. It's September 28, in 1982 in Vienna, Austria. That's when my spiritual journey towards homo spiritualis, if you will, really started. This photo is a little bit grainy, but you can see me on the right and shaking hands with a lady that I had just met. And she gave me an experience in meditation that truly changed the course of my life. And I would like to... Uh, talk a little bit more about this as we go along here. But this is how it all started. Her name is Shri Mataji, and she's uh, an Indian lady, as you can see. Shri Mataji traveled around the world tirelessly for many, many years to tell the people that the time has come for a change on a personal level, but also on a societal and on a global level. Human beings do have the potential to become something deeper, something very, very special. So let's watch how Sri Mataji is describing this in her own words. But before we start talking of truth, we have to know that truth is to be achieved in your awareness. It is not a mental projection that I say this is truth, that is truth, but it is to be achieved in the human awareness. 
as they say in Sanskrit, Chetana. In your awareness, you should know the truth. Like you see me now here standing before you. You know fully well that I'm here, that I have a shawl on. You can see it. You can feel it. I'm here before you as truth because your central nervous system relates to you that I'm here. And the truth is like that. Truth has to be felt in your awareness. It is not just somebody giving you a le lecture or reading it out from a book or saying this is truth, this is truth. The time has come for human beings that they are not going to accept anything like that. You may accept, but your children will not. And their children will never accept such a thing. So something has to happen to our awareness. That means at this stage where we are, at this stage when we are called as human beings, we have not felt the truth. We have not seen the truth. We are not the truth. That one position one has to accept. If you believe that this is the truth because it is in Ramayana or in some book or that book, then be sure that that truth is nothing but your mental projection. It's not the truth which is reality. So we are not to live with something fantasy or something that is not what we can feel through our central nervous system. So when I talk that the seekers of truth, and I bow to you, I mean to say people who will be honest about it. Those who are not honest, who are just clinging on to certain ideas, are fanatic and think that this is the truth, then I cannot help you. I can just say that come inside, within yourself, is place the truth. And just find it out for yourself because it is your own, it is within you. It is your own, it is within you. Only thing, you have to see it yourself and feel it yourself. The rest of it, the way people have all kinds of things about truth, is something that I feel all the honest people should completely deny. When we became human beings, say, we didn't do anything about it. We just became human beings. It's a simple thing. We did not stand on our heads or we didn't do anything to become uh, more human and less monkeys. It just happened spontaneously. So one has to understand that our evolution has come through a living process and through the living energy of God. God who is living and not a dead thing that can just give you some ideas and you cling to it which are dead. So the spontaneity of life has to work it out within you. That kind of awareness which makes you higher than what you are. At this stage as human beings, whatever we understand about life, whatever we know about life as truth, may be, may not be truth. Let's keep it open as that. It may be, may not be. For example, if I tell you something about a country which you have never visited, it may be, may not be. Better go to the country and see for yourself. And that's what one has to do, is to place yourself in such a way, let us see. Keep your minds open to see what is the truth about yourself. Now this truth has been told by many great sages, by prophets and many incarnations who came on earth. As we know, Christ has said about it, Nanaka has said about it, Kabira has said, Lao Tse has said, Buddha has said, everyone has said one thing, which is people, which I should say people neglect and are not bothered about it. And a simple thing is that you have to have your second birth. You have to know yourself. You have to have self-realization. This, every one of them have said it. Instead of that, we are building up something which doesn't lead us there. Take us to that land if somebody says, you just don't do that. You see, it's just an imaginary thing if I say, all right, now close your eyes, off we go to the kingdom of God. It's not that way. Something has to happen in your awareness, means 
Whatever you are feeling now, you should feel something more than that. You have to become something more. You have to expand more. And that expansion has to come not through just giving you a lecture or talking to you, but by something happening within yourself. So as Sri Mataji just said, something has to happen within ourselves. And I would like to expand on this a little bit uh, for the next few minutes, because there are parts inside us that we can't see, that we can't touch, and still they're very real and they exist. One of them, very important one, is what we call the subtle inner energy system. So as you can see on this diagram here, there are three lines, vertical lines, a blue one, a white one, and a yellow one. And there are also seven energy centers. As you can see, they're numbered one, two, three, all the way to seven along the central channel, the central uh, line here, the white one. And there are some other elements here. I will mention them as we go along. But the point is, none of that is physical. You can't see them. But if everything goes fine and you decide to go along on this journey, you should be able to feel them at the end of this conversation. All of that should not confuse you. It's just background information because in the end of the day, you don't need to know anything to get that experience that Sri Mataji calls self-realization. So let's look a bit. The left side channel is the side of emotions, feelings, and also all the memories of the past are stored here. If you look at the end, at the top of it, uh, in our head, it ends in a sort of in a balloon. So there's no exit. It's a finite dimension. So the emotion and the past flows here in terms of energy. On the other side, on the right side, we have the action and the element of the future. So when you plan ahead three months in advance and you set actions towards that, you use that type of energy. All of this exists inside of us. I also should say that the entire subtle system that you see here in the diagram is the basis of our physical, emotional, and mental being. So for example, the nervous plexuses that actually exist in our body physically are triggered by these energy centers and also controlled by them. Moving on to the central channel, which is governing the evolution and the present moment. If you think about this famous saying that the past is over and the future is not yet here, and actually the only reality is the present moment. Because whatever you may be planning three months in advance, you're not sure if this is actually happening. You could get sick, something else changes, plans fail, and something else happens. So the present moment is really the only reality in which we exist, present moment. That's very important to remember that. Now, if you look at the triangular area where this red arrow is just pointing, that is indicating the sacrum bone, which is at the base of our spine. And since ancient times, people knew that this bone, this triangular bone is special. They didn't know why. But now we do know that there is a potential energy stored in that. Now, potential energy, what does this actually mean? It means it can be activated. It can be activated to become real, to become active, to become tangible, feelable. 
And the concept that I'm asking you to comprehend right now is once this inner energy gets activated inside of us, it starts moving upwards, going through all these energy centers, and in turn, those open, you could say like flowers, and the qualities of these energy centers, each one is different, comes into your awareness, like a flower shares its perfume when it opens, right? So this inner energy, or Kundalini, as it is known in India, in Sanskrit, is known since long time. And many systems exist out there that attempt to awaken this inner energy, though not all of them are authorized and some of them may be even be harmful. In this case, in my own experience, it's the opposite. It is actually helpful, it's nourishing. It is a mothering energy. So there's a lot of love involved in that, a lot of understanding, a lot of compassion, forgiveness, all of that, because none of us is perfect, right? And so with this energy activated, our journey within, as Sri Mataji has just mentioned it, can actually start. So this is the starting point to awaken this energy. Now, let's look at these seven energy centers a little bit more in detail. As you can see, the red arrow moved uh, to an energy center at the very base of our spine. It's below the triangular bone and it is expressing innocence in its main quality. Now, innocence is a quality that may not be easy to understand. At least for me, it took a while to comprehend what this means. But when I look at my children and especially grandchildren now, I can see it in plain sight and in action. They don't plan. They live in the present moment and they do what needs to be done at that moment in time. And they never mean harm with any of that. Innocence is a very powerful energy which is stored in this energy center at the bottom of our spine. In Sanskrit, it is called Muladhara, meaning the center of the roots. So the tree of life has roots and they are right here in the Muladhara chakra. Now let's look at the next one above, number two, Svadhisthana chakra. It stands for creativity. Creation is something that we can do as human beings, but in a very limited dimension. I have to say as a designer, I'm very much aware of that. I cannot create a living thing. I cannot create a living flower out of nothing. Though if you look at the Mother Earth, for example, she does it all the time. Season after season, spring is coming around and uh, the trees start blooming and flowers start coming out and out of flowers become fruits. This is beyond human capacity. No human being can create out of a flower a fruit. So creativity in a way allows us to sort of mimic the power of the creation. But this energy center goes far beyond in its capacity of what we normally describe as uh, being creative. Let's go to the next one. The Nabi Chakra is around the level of the navel. It is representing the quality of sustenance, meaning on a physical level, we digest food, but sustenance is more than eating. It's the well-being, it's the social interactions, and there are some aspects that will go a little bit too far here, but sustenance is something that is happening to us. It's not something that we actively or consciously do. You know, I'm a designer, I'm not a doctor, and honestly, I have no idea how my digestion works. 
but I do feel its results, its effects. If I eat something, I feel satisfied. So satisfaction is another aspect of this center. Moving on to the fourth one, that's at the level of the heart, if you will. Behind the sternum bone is an energy center that is called Anahata or heart chakra. Its main quality is security. Security on many levels. So for example, if this chakra is very well balanced, fear does not exist within us. And you see this very well in small children. I have seen a little girl running across the street while traffic is going on, unperturbed, arrives on the other end, and poor mom, who is witnessing that, had the shock of her life and her heart starts palpitating and she was shouting and felt very tangible fear. There are many aspects to that beyond security, but you could say behind the sternum bone on the physical level is also the place where the antibodies are created that help us to fight off intruders like viruses or any other diseases. And if this center is not very balanced, then also the, the subtle system that works to protect us will become weaker. So there's a very tangible physical result as well. Next one, the Vishuddhi chakra or the center at the level of the throat. It stands for collectivity. Collectivity means many things. We communicate from me to you, for example, through the energy that is provided through this energy center. But also beyond that, our physical manifestations, in this case, it is ether, which allows us to communicate beyond our own physical limitations. Think of television, think of the internet, think of the telephone, right? All of that is carried through the collective activities of this energy center. There is one more aspect that may be important closer towards the end of this journey, when sensitivity in the hands becomes an issue. Because the nerves that go into our hands originate from the central nervous system at that very point. So sometimes we can feel numbness in our hands or we feel sensations in our fingers that are not very clear what this means. All of this uh, becomes clearer once that Kundalini is awakened and also becomes easier to understand and to manage. Next up, number six, at the level of the forehead is an energy center that's called Agya or Agnya. Its main quality is forgiveness. And that's another one of these mysteries that are not easy to understand. Why is forgiveness a quality? If somebody harms me and I am upset, then forgiving is not an easy thing to do. But once you realize that once you are harmed and you cannot forgive, you harm yourself even more because that harm lingers on. If you can forgive, you really don't do anything to the other person that may have harmed you. The other person may not even be aware whether you forgive or not. But forgiveness is a power to help yourself find balance again after somebody may have harmed you. So forgiveness, in short, is self-help. It's self-easing of undesirable situations. Forgiveness is a very powerful energy. We will talk more about this a little bit later. Right now we move on to the seventh energy center that's on top of our head. Actually, it's slightly one or two inches above, right at the point where the soft or open spot is when we are children. That closes later on. And this energy center or Sahasrara is integration in its essence. 
So everything that I explained to you so far is integrated into this energy center. And it opens like a beautiful lotus flower once this Kundalini reaches that point. Once it reaches that point, that inner energy that I mentioned earlier, and this, all these chakras open, then the actual yoga happens. And yoga in the West, I have to say, is often misunderstood because people think it's physical exercise, but it's not. Yoga in its original Sanskrit meaning means actually union. Union with a larger dimension with a more subtle dimension, which a more collective dimension. So yoga is like you plug in your television into the mains and suddenly can do things that it couldn't do before. It was just a black box, right? Once it's plugged in and connected, then you can actually see what this black box was originally intended for. Same thing with our human subtle system. It's not all, as I said at the very beginning, that we just live and then we pass away. That's not everything. That connection, that yoga, is really one of the main incision points in the life of a human being where suddenly dimensions open that we were not aware of. Now, how do we get there? Meditation is the only way to do that. You could say in, in very short, there is an energy within you that is very eager to get you into the state of meditation. All you need to do just get out of the way. So remember, I said a state of meditation. So meditation is not an activity. Meditation is a state of our awareness. Like we have an awake awareness, we have a sleep awareness, we have dreams, and then we also have a state of meditation where the brain waves indicates that something very different is actually happening in the brain. So it's an actual experience. Meditation is the way to awaken this inner energy. And you really need only one requirement to learn how to meditate. You need to desire it. The desire is a very powerful tool that we have within us. And once you desire it, everything will happen automatically because as she not that she said earlier, we are already made like that. Everything is ready. All the energy system inside of us is ready. The Kundalini is ready, but our freedom is respected. We do have freedom to either accept or not accept that offering that I'm making to you right now. So here ends the theoretical part of this video. I talk to you about, you know, who are we? I give you a hypothesis. I explain to you the different parts of the subtle system that exists within us. I told you hypothetically what happens if this Kundalini energy gets awakened. But I think now is the time to verify what we have heard so far. Let's remember that self-realization is an actual inner experience. So next I will play a video where Shri Mataji herself will take us through a very simple exercise that I'm asking you to follow along during which we will be able to actually feel on our nervous system the manifestation of this inner energy I have been talking about. It really hardly takes about six minutes. So I hope you have that time 
simply follow the instructions and then we all will close our eyes and go into that state of meditation. You all are capable of getting self life all of you. Whatever must be your past and now, we have to be in the present. Past is finished, future doesn't exist, you will be in the present and that's the reality which you all can feel the vibration. So, one should not have any such ideas that I've done this wrong, how can I get realization? This is unnecessary. You should not, you should never, never think that you are guilty. If you were, you would, you would have been in the jail, you would not have been here. So, don't think you are guilty. Don't judge yourself. You don't know yourself. It is to know yourself you have to do this. And don't judge. You must have great respect and love for yourself. And I am sure it will work out tonight as desired by these people. But those who don't want to have Self-Realization, I would say they can go. Because I don't want them to disturb others. Supposing if you don't want, it cannot be forced. It has to be asked for. You cannot force it onto anyone. You cannot pay for it. You cannot do anything about it. But if the Kundalini doesn't rise, it's all right. We'll have a center where you can go and get it corrected. Maybe something wrong in the chakras which you do not know, and they will find out. So it will take hardly any time. Hardly any time. Have faith in yourself. First of all, have faith in yourself and this will work out. First, I think to forgive others is difficult. The, you see, the Western people, they cannot forgive themselves. And for Indians, the other way now. They cannot forgive others. You see, I don't know why there is this kind of a uh, different, I mean, attitude. But we should forgive ourselves also. God has created you as human being, not to be ruined like this, not to be shattered like this, but to achieve your glory. You have to just put your hands towards me like this. I think if you have shoes, you'd have to take it out. Helps us a lot. We are sitting in Delhi. We are here in this Bharat Bhumi, in this Yoga Bhumi. It works very fast. In this country, it works very fast. And also with you people, because you love this country very much, you work so hard for this country. So it works very fast. So don't have any apprehensions. Um, just put your both the hands like this. Again, I would request you must forgive yourself and others. That's very important because if you don't do that, then you are center here, we call the Vishuddhi Chakra, will be blocked. I mean, the guilt part is you will block, and if you don't forgive, then this Adya Chakra will be blocked. Please put your hands like this, a little lower. Now.
First, we'll start feeling some cool or hot breeze on your fingertips and also on your thumb. Then, in the palm, you start feeling a cool or a hot breeze. Some people start thinking that this air conditioning, it has nothing to do with air conditioning. So please have faith in yourself. <clears throat> now, please put right hand towards me and put down, put your, put down your head a little and feel with your left hand on top of your fontanel bone area, which was called as talu. If there's a cool or a hot breeze coming out, now please put down your heads a little and see for yourself. Move your hand. It might be coming very far, maybe very close, but don't put your hand on top, but above. Just move, please, move it on the sides and see for yourself that it's a cool or a hot breeze like coming. It is hot means you have not forgiven. It means only that you have to really say, I forgive. You have to, don't have to do anything except you have to say in your heart, I forgive everyone. That's a very great quality. Hmm. Now please put your left hand towards me and see with your right hand, again bend your head please, and see for yourself if there's a cool or a hot breeze coming out of your head. Just see for yourself. Now, please put your right hand again. Right hand is more. So put the right hand like this and see for yourself. Now again put both the hands towards me. And don't think, just, just don't think. You can stop thinking, even for a second. That's very good. This is called as nirvicharita. Then comes a stage to become nirvikalpa. When there is no doubt in your head, you become into doubtless awareness. Where you're sure you've got it, you're sure you can do everything. That is the stage one has to rise. So, I do hope that you can feel now this silence inside of you that Sri Mataji is calling as thoughtless awareness. You may notice there are no thoughts or just a few. Ideally, what I try at this point, mm -hmm. I don't pay attention to my thoughts, let them go, don't follow, and try to stay in that silence. That silence experience is really the beginning of the meditation. From there, the journey within is starting. Without that silence, it's all mental. So let's just stay in this silence for a little bit more. So thank you so much for joining me in this journey all the way up till now, I'd like to quickly just give you a very short summary. Our differences as humans are really only skin deep. Inside, we're all the same, we cry the same, we eat the same, 
we enjoy the same. So the differences are only on the surface. In reality, we are one. Once we are connected to that all-pervading energy that I explained earlier, when the seventh center gets opened through the rising of the Kundalini, that yoga, that union connects us with the totality of everything that exists. It's difficult to find words for this really, but if you want to have a metaphor, you could think it's like a drop of water that may fall out of a cloud in form of a rain. And while it falls, it has a shape, it has a form, it has a weight, it has all kinds of things. But once it falls into the ocean, it becomes the ocean. It loses its limitations. That water drop doesn't lose any of its substance, but it loses its limitations. Our subtle inner energy system is ready. And very importantly, self-realization is an actual, real experience, not just anything that you write about in social media or you think about. So with this, we have reached the end of this short journey. If you are interested to learn more about this, I recommend the website vmeditate.co. It is very rich in background information, but also has many more videos that you can use to meditate along, learn about yourself, practice, and also observe how you evolve in your inner journey. With this, I am grateful that you're here and I wish you deep experiences in this journey within. And I do hope we shall meet again anytime soon. Thank you.